So good morning to all of you. So today I'll be discussing the uh, first three to four topics of module four. So let's start with nutrition. As nursing assistant, we are uh, we will be assisting our nurses to help our patient in their nutritional needs. So before we uh, go to the complicated part of nutrition, let us first uh, discuss the basic aspects of nutrition. So first, let us discuss the definition of terms and what is nutrition? So nutrition, it is the process involved in the ingestion, digestion, absorption, and use of foods and fluids. All of, all of our patients, they need nutrients, okay, to, so they can regain strength, they can recover uh, as fast as possible. They need nutrients. And these nutrients are substances that is ingested, digested, absorbed, and used by the body. Our gastrointestinal system is the one who is responsible for this nutritional nutritional processes what is calorie calorie it is a fuel and energy value of each food so this is very uh, prominent if your patient is having uh, diabetes and the dietitian is asking you how many calories is allowed for this patient or the doctor ordered for the caloric requirement for a certain type of uh, condition. So now let's go with the primary nutrients. We are always, uh, we are all familiar with this types of our primary nutrients since we were in our elementary school. Uh, what is protein? So protein, it is the most important nutrients, okay? What is the function of your protein is it will help in muscle regeneration, tissue repair. So if you have a wound, what will happen, it, it will uh, regenerate the skin fast and it will repair any tissues that is being damaged by any injury. So that is protein. So usually if you have a uh, pressure ulcer, you will notice that the doctor will order for increase in protein diet. So what are the sources of protein? We have the meat, the fish, the poultry, the eggs, milk, and milk products. We have also cereals, beans, peas, and nuts. So carbs or carbohydrates okay it provides energy okay the main function of carbohydrates is energy we all know that carbohydrates it will break down sugar and that sugar is necessary or very vital for our brain functioning our brain is the main controlling system of our body so without this uh, sugar it will not function so all our body processes will cease so we we should have this nutrients, okay, especially if we will be starting our day. So they are telling that the, the important part of our meal is the uh, breakfast. And we should take carbohydrates or carbs product during this meal. So we will have energy the whole day. So example of carbohydrates are uh, rice, bread, cereals, and some fruits and vegetables. Next is fats. Fats is also an energy provider, okay? If you don't have a carbs, you all metabolize your carbs in your body, your fats will be burning. They provide flavor and help the body use certain vitamins. So that's why we are having ketogenic diet. Okay, if you're familiar with ketogenic diet, you're only eating fats. And if you're only eating fats, okay, you don't have carbs in your uh, diet. So what will be burned in your body is only fats. That's why you will lose uh, weight. It's very effective in losing weight. So what are the sources of fats? We have the meats, lards, butter, short, uh, shortening oils, milk, 
cheese, egg yolks, and nuts. And we have also vitamins. Vitamins is very crucial, especially this time of pandemic, because we should have vitamins in our uh, fight for any microorganisms or any viruses or bacteria. So our immune system will be strong. Okay. So what are the examples of vitamins? We have the, our sources of vitamins. We have our fruits and vegetables. We have two types of vitamins. We have the water-soluble and the fat-soluble vitamins. Those fat-soluble vitamins, we are calling it as ADEC, vitamin A, D, E, and K. These are the type of vitamins which is not flushed out in our body. It means that they are stored in fatty layers of our body, except for the vitamin D. Okay, so next, water-soluble. So water-soluble vitamins, in contrast with the former, okay, water-soluble vitamins, it, it is uh, a type of vitamins which is flushed out in our body. It doesn't store in our body. Example of these vitamins are vitamin C and the B-complex vitamins. So if you're taking a lot of vitamin C in your body, okay, you don't have any risk of overdose because it will be flushed out in your body immediately through urine, sweating, and other uh, output. Next is minerals. Minerals are used for many body uh, processes such as bone and tooth formation, nerve and muscle function, and fluid balance. Okay, example of minerals are calcium. Calcium is very good in the uh, in our bones, okay? Without this calcium, we'll be having bone problems like osteoporosis, osteomalacia, or, or any other uh, diseases. And lastly, water. Water is very important, guys. Our body is composed of 60 to 75% of water. And without water, okay, our body processes will stop. One important uh, function of water is it is a primary component of our blood and blood runs out of our all over our body so specifically the plasma the component of blood okay it has a large percentage of water so without water the plasma will be decreased so if there's will be decreased plasma there will be a decreased blood volume and I told you that if there's a blood volume is equal to blood pressure. So if the, there will be a decrease in blood volume, there will be a decrease in blood pressure. So there will be hyper, hypotension. And if there will be hypotension, there will be shock. Hypotensive shock, hypovolemic shock. Next, let's go with the special diets. These special diets, we are seeing this in the hospital. Uh, the dietitian is giving a patient a special type of diet depends depending on the patient's condition. For example, diabetes, diabetic diet, for example, uh, hypertensive patient, low salt, low fat diet, and so on. So let's take a look what are those diets. Uh, first is high caloric diet. The, ind the indication of high caloric diet is for those patients who is thin or uh, those patients who have problems with thyroid. Because if you have problem with thyroids, your metabolism will, will be fast. So that's called hyper hyperthyroidism. So if your metabolism is fast, you will have you will lose weight. So you need a high caloric diet, usually about 3,000 to 4,000 daily. So you need a decrease in all foods, large amounts of regular diet with three between meal snacks. You're very lucky. Next is caloric controlled. So as opposite to the first, okay, caloric controlled diet is for weight reduction or for those patients who who is obese. 
So this diet uh, sources is foods low in fats and carbohydrates and lean meats. Avoid butter, cream, rices, rice, gravy, salad, oils, noodles, cakes, paste, pastries, because these are the foods that will gain you weight. Next is high iron yet. What is the importance of iron in our body? Iron is very important in our blood because without iron, no hemoglobin. So, so if you have no hemoglobin or less hemoglobin, you'll have anemia. That's why you need to increase your iron or you, you need to take high iron diet okay, for treatment of anemia. Sources of this are liver and other organ meats, lean meats, egg yolks, shellfish, dried fruits, dried beans, green leafy vegetable, and the like. Next is fat-controlled or low cholesterol diet. Cholesterol, we, we are having a high density cholesterol or HDL and we have low density cholesterol. We have bad cholesterol and we have good cholesterol. But if we are taking a lot of cholesterol or excess cholesterol in the body, it will be in it will be a source of plaque or a heart problem. So we need to control the cholesterol level of patients uh, of those who's uh, having heart disease, gallbladder disease, liver disease, and disease of the pancreas. Okay, because all of these gallbladder, uh, liver disease, and pancreas, these are uh, the digestive uh, organ which helps in the fat absorption. Without this one, if they have problem, they will not absorb or they will not break down the fats appropriately. So you will have more fat. So you need to lessen the amount of cholesterol in the diet. So you need only to give the patient skim milk or any fish, cheese, cottage cheese, uh, gelatin sorbet, skim milk, breads and cereals, vegetables, and potatoes. Next is high protein diet. High protein diet, as I've told you, protein is for tissue regeneration or tissue repair. Okay, so for those patients who's having burns, high fever, infection, and some liver diseases, this is very uh, vital. So the sources of protein uh, are meat, milk, eggs, cheese, uh, fish, poultry, breads, and cereals, green leafy vegetables. Sodium controlled diet. Okay, as I've told you before, that sodium controlled diet is very helpful for those patients with hypertension or heart diseases, liver diseases, and kidney diseases, because these heart diseases, liver disease, and kidney diseases, they all have hypertension. Okay, so excess sodium is not allowed for them because it will uh, further the uh, disease. So what are the sources of sodium controlled diet? Fruits and vegetables and unsalted butter. Adding salt at the table is not allowed. Highly salted foods and food high in sodium are not allowed. And use of salt during cooking may be restricted. So if you're a fan of salt, okay, and you're always putting uh, salt in your food, uh, you will be not used in this type of diet. So next diet is diabetic diet. Diabetic meal plan usually, this or, or basically this is for di diabetic patient. And dietitian is controlling the amount of calories. Uh, it depends upon the weight of the patient, the age of the patient, the condition of the patient, or the amount of sugar the patient is having. Okay, so... The dietitian is computing the enough carbs, protein, and fat uh, required for each patient, for, for, for a specific patient each day. So we have a wrong perception. If you are having diabetes, what uh, we are not allowed to eat 
we, we are not allowed to eat rice. That's a wrong perception, guys, because for diabetic patients, we need to give them an enough or sufficient amount of uh, sugar or carbohydrates. Why? Because they have risk of hypoglycemia because they are taking insulin or oral hypoglycemic agent. So you need to give them enough carbs in their diet. So don't remove your rice. Only one cup of rice is allowed, but not, uh, not, not exceed with uh, one, one cup. Next is the diet for patients postoperatively or yes, postoperatively. For those patients is having uh, operation of any part of gastrointestinal tracts like appendicy, append, appendectomy, okay, operation of the append, appendix. So we should follow the diet progression. So diet progression from NPO, the diet will not progress immediately to regular diet. To give time for your stomach or for your gastrointestinal to heal, you need to progress your diet slowly by slowly because it will irritate the stomach or the gastrointestinal tract. So after the NPO, the doctor will order first a clear liquid diet. So clear liquid diet, these are food liquids that bod at body temperature and which leave small amount of residue, non-irritating and non-gas forming. It is very useful for post-operative acute illness, infection, nausea and vomiting, and to prepare for GI exams. Okay, for if the doctor wants to visualize your sigmoid, your colon, okay, they will order for you clear liquid. Then what are the sources of clear liquids? We have the water, the tea, the coffee, but without milk, carbonated drinks, gelatin, clear fruit juices like apple, grape, and cranberry, uh, fat-free clear broth, hard candy. Okay, maybe you are surprised why hard candy is included. But hard candy, when, when, you, eat, when you eat the hard candy, it's not irritating to your stomach, okay? and popsicles. After NPO clear liquids, it will proceed to full liquid diet. So foods are liquid at room temperature or melt at the body temperature. So it is advanced from the clear liquid diet. So it is useful to post-operative for stomach irritation, fever, nausea, and vomiting for person unable to chew and swallow and digest solid foods. So what are the sources of full liquid diet? So these are clear liquid diet plus custard, eggnog, strain, strain soups, uh, strain fruit and vegetable, juices, milk, shakes, strain, uh, cooked cereals, plain ice cream, and sherbet. So we can see, we, we can give milk at this time. Okay, the one with color, uh, with fluids with color. So we can give to this patient full liquid. When we're talking about mechanically soft, so after full liquid, it will progress to the next type of special diet, which is mechanically soft. So the food they're giving, it's like a regular diet, but it is blenderized one or mashed one. So it is a semi-solid foods that are usually easily digested. So advice from the full liquid diet, chewing problems uh, for GI problems and infection. So all liquids, eggs, but not fried, broiled, baked, or roasted meat. Okay, it's included to the soft diet. Fish and poultry that is chopped or shredded. It's a soft diet. Juices and etc. Next, let's go with the fiber and residue restricted. Fiber, what's the function of fiber in your body? Okay, it will allow you to uh, ease. It will give you an ease to pass motion or to pass uh, stool. Okay, because it will help in the peristalsis of the gastrointestinal tract. But for those patients who's having 
diseases of the colon and diarrhea. Okay, their peristalsis is so uh, hyperactive, so they don't need the fiber that helps the peristalsis. So they need to decrease the fiber in their diet. So what are the examples? Examples, uh, coffee, tea, milk, carbonated drinks, strained fruit juices, refined bread and crackers, creamed and refined cereals, rice, cottage, and cream cheese, plain uh, puddings and cake, gelatin, custard, sherbet, and ice cream. So these are the fiber and residue restricted. On the other hand, high fiber diet, okay, those with high fiber content. So these are for patients with constipation because the patient has hard stools and has difficulty to pass the stool. This uh, fiber is very important for them. So all fruits and veg vegetables uh, are with high fiber diet. Also whole grains, wheat bread, cereals, fried foods, whole grain rice, milk, cream, butter, and cheese. So blood diet, uh, it's also called a slight diet. It is non-irritating to the stomach. It is low in roughage and food served at moderate temperature and there's no strong spices and condiments. If you like spices like Indians, okay, they will not love the bland diet because it has no taste at all. So these are useful for patients with ulcers, gallbladder disorders, and some intestinal disorders after abdominal surgery. So example of this are lean meats, but white bread, cream, lean meats, white bread, cream and refined cereals, cottage cheese, gelatin, puddings, cake, and etc. So as nursing assistant guys, we can help in preparing for the patient's meal. Okay, we are very, we are responsible. We are, we can be helpful so they can eat and will achieve a nutritious uh, meal and will improve their uh, nutritional intake. So what are the guidelines in preparing for mealtime? First, assist the person with toileting. Before eating, you should ask your patient if he wants to void or he wants to defecate so it will not disturb the mealtime. Assist the person also with basic hygiene. Always wash the hands, especially nowadays that there's a lot of infections spreading. So you should assist the patient in their basic hygiene and wear their dentures and glasses or hearing aid so it will be easy for them. Then positioning of the patient is very important, especially for those patients who has difficulty swallowing or dysphagia. Dysphagia, it means you have difficulty swallowing. So you can see this for those patients who had stroke or spinal cord injury and other diseases, okay? So you should position the patient properly. So what's the correct position for this patient? You should position them into high Fowler's position. Why? To prevent aspiration. Provide a pleasant environment. If the patient voided, remove all the bedpans, the urinals, okay, next to the patient. So the patient will eat well and there will be no offensive odor that the patient will experience. So always provide a pleasant environment. So while assisting the patient to eat, always check the trays if it matches the name of the patient, okay? Some of the, uh, some of the kitchen person, they'll just give a tray which is incorrect with the patient. So what will happen if one patient receive a wrong, uh, wrong diet, okay, for example, the diet of this patient is soft diet and that kitchen person 
give him a regular diet. So the patient might have difficulty swallowing the food and it will cause choking or aspiration. So you should be careful. Also make sure that the diet noted on the tray ma matches the person's medical chart. So if the medical chart told that it should be diabetic diet, the tray should also match with diabetic diet. You should place a protector on the chest so to prevent from soiling of the uh, soiling of the dress. Then encourage the patients and resident to do as much for themselves. Don't let the patient to be dependent on you. Let them uh, have their independence. So during the time they will be discharged, okay, they will know and they will handle and manage themselves. Uh, assist devices are available to help people with physical impairments to eat on their own. So as I've told you, position is very important to prevent aspiration. Now, let's go with fluid balance. So as I've told you, 60 to 75% of your body is composed of water. So we'll do a calculation of your intake and output because uh, so you will know how to compute the intake and output. So fluid balance, what is fluid ba balance? Let's define some terms first. Fluid balance, it is the state of equilibrium in which the amount of fluid consumed equals, it should be equal. The amount, the intake should be equal to the output, okay? So what is intake? Intake, the amount of fluid you take in. What are the sources of intake? You have the oral through the mouth, tube through the tube feeding like NGT, peg feeding, parenteral through the IV fluids, intravenous medications like IV medications like antibiotics, like paracetamol IV, then catheter tube irrigants. Okay, when we are flushing the catheter, we are instilling fluid inside the body. So it is considered a source of intake. And wound drainage. If you want to in, uh, what's this? To flush the wound, okay, we, instilling, we are instilling also fluids. So we should record also this one as intake. Next, on the other hand, output, it is the amount of fluid lost. Okay, it can be a urine, a vomitus. Okay, vomitus means the substance from vomiting. Okay, then feces, then tube drainage. Okay, if you are having abdominal tube, okay, and ready back drain from the wound, this is kind of, uh, this is sources, one source of output. Then draining fistulas. So let's define, let's differentiate what uh, is edema and dehydration. When we're talking about edema, both of the first letter is E. So you'll not forget that edema, there's in, there is an excess. Usually edema, you will see this for a patient who is having chronic kidney disease. So if you are having chronic kidney disease, you will have your kidney is not functioning well. So what's your what's the function of your kidney? Your kidney is flushing waste product through urine. So if you're not flushing, if you have a problem with kidneys, you will not be able to flush this waste product or urine. So it will be retained, it will retain on your body like in your legs, on your foot, on your hands. Or any other problem like heart, okay, if you have congestion or lung congestion, it can be a cause of edema. Then dehydration. Dehydration is deficit, okay? It is a decrease in the amount of water in the body, okay? If you vomited three, 10 times a day, 10 times, for 10 times, and every vomiting, you, you're vomiting approximately 200 ml. So 200 times 10, how many times you'll, how many fluids are 
uh, your uh, excreting from your body. So it will be detrimental. So we have different special fluid orders. If we're talking about encouraged fluids, we will encourage fluids for those patients who has deficit, okay, like dehydration. So as if, if you experience AGE or dehydration, the doctor will tell you just drink uh, one to one liter to 1.5 liters of water per day. So you can fill the deficit of fluids. Then if you're talking about restrict, restrict fluids, this is applicable for those patients who is having edema because there's an excess. So you need to decrease the fluid. Then nothing per RM for those patients who will be operated, okay? Or for those patients who is vomiting, they need to not eat first. So uh, to give time for their stomach to ring strength. Then thickened liquids, okay? For those patients who has problem with swallowing or dysphagia, okay? Taken liquids is advised compared to the liquids, okay? Only simple liquids like water. Uh, taken liquids, they'll just make the liquid stick, okay? So there will be a less chance of aspiration and coughing because if there is a simple liquid, okay, the, the normal liquid that we are taking, we have a higher risk of aspiration because it will go uh, immediately to our uh, gastrointestinal tract or to our throat. But if the, it's taken slowly by slowly, it will go down to your uh, esophagus that will prevent you from having aspiration. So next, Measuring and recording intake and output. It defines as a measurement and recording of all the fluid intake and output during the 24 hour period. It provides important data about the client's fluid and electrolyte balance. Guys, you should memorize this uh, measurement of volume. So one teaspoon is equal to 15 ml, one cup is two, 240 ml. Usually we are using ml for computation of intake and output. So eight ounces is 240 ml. One teaspoon is lower than tablespoon. It is five ml. One cup is eight ounces. 16 ounces is one pound. One ounce is 30 ml. One pint is 50 ml. And one quart is 1000 ml. So what are the guidelines in measuring intake and output? First, we should I sorry. So first, we should identify whether the person has undergone surgery or medical condition and takes medication. We should measure also and record all the intake and output. Usually. Every eight hours, we are measuring the intake and output, okay? If the patient is ordered for strict intake and output or INO, okay, we should follow it strictly because the doctor will uh, follow, uh, will check on it strictly. So especially for those patients who is having kidney diseases, it should be accurate, okay? The measurement is accurate. So we have, we have different types of shift. We have eight hour shift and we have 12 hour shift. So usually eight, after eight hours, we should compute the intake and output of the patient. Record the ice chips as fluid at approximately half their volume. So if you took an ice chip for a vomiting patient because ice chip is helpful to prevent vomiting or to decrease vomiting, okay? So if you approximate it, uh, for example, 100 ml of ice chip, okay, you gave to your patient, okay, you divide it by two or the 50% of 100, it will be 50 ml. So you will record the half of the 100 ml, which is the 50 ml. 
Record also the type and the amount of all fluids the patient has lost and the route. If irrigating with nasogastric in another tube or the bladder, measure the amount instilled and subtract it from the total output. For accurate measurement, okay, some patients, they have this attitude that they will, after urinating, the toilet, uh, the toilet paper that they they used, okay, for uh, perineal care, they will put it on the urinal and bed pan. So what will happen? It will be inaccurate. So uh, tell your patient to not do, to uh, not uh, throw the toilet paper in the. Uh, urinal and bed pan because the measurement will be inaccurate. Then measure drainage in a calibrated container. If we are using a, if we are measuring the uh, output of the patient, for example, urine, we should have a calibrated glass and this calibrated glass, glass we should observe it uh, in our eye level and we should put it on a flat surface to make it accurate. Then evaluate patterns and values outside the normal range, okay? Keeping in mind the typical 24 hour intake and output. By the way, guys, the normal intake and output or the normal urine of the patient should uh, excrete from the body for 24 hours is 1,500 1, ml. And 30 ml per hour if the patient is having polycatheter. So if beyond this or below this, okay, there, there, is an, er, there is a problem. Then when looking at eight hour urine output, ask how many times the patient voided to identify the problems. Regard intake and output holistically because age, diagnosis, medical problems, and type of surgical procedure can affect the amounts. You should not always look for the amount, okay? You should always look for the quality. For example, you're not only measuring the urine, but also you're assessing the quality of urine or the characteristic of the urine, like the color. The normal color of urine is yellow, okay? The normal consistency of urine, it is clear. But if you saw that the urine is cloudy, it means something, it means infection. If you saw blood in the urine, it means that there is bleeding. So you should report it immediately to the nurse in charge. Don't use the same graduated container for more than once, okay? It will cause contamination or cross-contamination from one patient to another. Okay, so how will be we, how we will measure the intake and output? So, okay, let's do this math. Okay, if your patient vomited 50 ml and then he has oral intake of two cups of coffee, one cup of mango juice, two cups of water, the urine output is 1000 ml and he has he defecated for once only, okay? So the question is, what is the total intake and output? So let's compute. <clears throat> so vomitus, it is considered an out, output, correct? Because it will come out from the body. Then, the coffee, the mango, and the water, it's an oral intake. Then the urine will be output. The stool will be the output. So let's add. Before that, we should convert the cups of coffee into ml. So one cup is equal to 240 ml. So we got two cups of coffee times 240 is equal to 480. Two cups, one cup of mango juice times 240 is 240 ml. Two cups of water, okay, times 240 is 480 ml. So the total intake is 1,200. So you'll add it up. 
then if we're uh, computing the total output, we'll just add the 100 ml urine and the 50 ml vomitus. So it will be 1,050 ml. The stool, if the stool is liquid, we can add it to the output. But if the stool is semi-form or form, we will just putting it on how many times the patient had uh, has defecated. So it doesn't it doesn't need to be uh, computed. So to know if it 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 if we are having fluid balance, we'll just deduct one thousand two hundred to 1050. So the answer is 150. So it means that there is an excess because the intake is greater than the output. So it will be an excess. But 150, it is insignificant. Why it's insignificant? We will report the excess or deficit if it will reach for 500 to 1000 ml. And 150, it is very minimal. Okay. So another example. We have tube feeding. Each tube feeding is 250 ml. Okay. Per feeding. So every four hours, you're doing this. Uh, tube feeding. So tube feeding is A, intake. Urine is output. So you have 250 ml, stool is twice. Wound drainage, okay, wound drainage as output is 50 ml. So what is the total intake and output? So, so let's check. So let's compute first the intake. So 250 ml, we multiply it by six. Where we got the six? Because the six, it means that two, every four hours, how many hours in 24 hours? So you divide 24 by four, you'll get the six. It means per day, you are feeding six times at the interval of four hours, okay? So 250 times six is equal to 1,500. So that is your total intake. So total output, let's add the 2,500 of urine and the 50 ml of wound drainage. So it will be 2,550. And let's deduct. So our intake is lesser than an hour output. So 1,500 ml deduct from 2,550 2, ml, it will be at 10 or 1,050 ml. So it will be deficit. Why deficit? Because you have a less intake, but you have a high output. So what will happen? You have less intake, but high output. So you will be dehydrated. So it will be deficit. So we have a lot of examples of this. I'll give it for you. Please practice and I will make it as a quiz. Next, let's go to intravenous therapy. So intravenous therapy, okay. Maybe some of you is asking why we are uh, teaching this lesson. It's because intravenous therapy, we are not inserting the catheter for the patient. We are not introducing the intravenous therapy for the patient, but we are assisting the nurses to or the patient for intravenous therapy. Okay, let's first define what is intravenous therapy. IV therapy, it's the fluids are given through a small catheter. So the nurse will insert a catheter that is uh, in, the, in the vein and it, 
and it will deliver an IV fluid or any IV medication. So it is a not source of complete nutrition, but it is useful when a person needs fluids. So as a nursing assistant, we should know the equipments being used for IV. Why? Because the nurses will ask us, can you please bring me this? Can you please bring me this? If you don't know what's, what are those, okay, you will not help the nurse. So we have different IV equipments. We have the IV bag, the catheter or the needle, the IV tube or the infusion tubing, which has a drip chamber and clamp. We have also IV pole or ceiling hook. So let's, let's take a look. Uh, so this is the IV fluid, okay? We have different IV fluid in the hospital. This is the IV catheters, okay? So the orange one, this is color orange. On the left, this is gauge 14. The gray one is gauge 16. Next, green one is gauge 18. Pink one is gauge 20. Blue one is gauge 22. Yellow one is gauge 24, and the violet one is gauge 26. Okay, so if you notice, the larger the gauge, the lesser the number. Okay, for example, this one, gauge, 20, uh, gauge 14. So gauge 14, but it is the biggest gauge. It means what is the biggest gauge? The biggest needle, okay? Unlike this one, the larger the number, like this, the, the violet one is 26, but it is the smallest gauge. It has a smallest gauge or the smallest needle. So the nurse will ask you, can you bring me gauge 20 needle? Can you bring me gauge 20, gauge 22 needle? So you should know the gauge of the catheter. So this is the IV tubing, okay? This is the drip chamber where the fluid is dripping. This is the roller clamp, okay, or the control clamp, okay? You, can, you are not allowed to control the clamp, okay? If you saw the, the IV fluid is running fast or running slow, you should inform the nurse immediately, okay? But don't regulate it. IV therapy, uh, one IV equipments or device is the IV pole, okay? So this is where they hang the IV fluid. Next is flow rate, okay? What is flow rate? It is the number of drops per minute or ml per hour. I will not teach you how to compute this, but if you saw that the fluid it's not dripping, okay? If you saw in the drip chamber, it's not dripping, you should report it to the nurse. If the rate is so fast, you should re report it to the nurse because the patient might be congested, maybe con may cause congestion. Then if the rate is too low, you should inform also, okay? Why? Because it will clog the IV tubing. If there's no uh, there, if there's no fluid dripping, then any IV complications. What are those complications? If you notice in the IV site, if there's any redness, if it's feeling warm, feeling cold, swelling, okay, pain on the site, you should re report it to the nurse immediately. When we are assisting in IV therapy, we should always follow the standard precaution. Do not move the needle or catheter. If the patient told you the catheter is pulled out almost, don't move it or remove it or move it further. Why? Because you are not allowed to do that. It's not your job description. If that happens, you should inform the nurse in charge. Next, follow the safety measures for restraint. Please don't put the restraint next to the IV, okay, IV catheter, because it will cause 
injury or damage of the catheter. Protect the bag, tubing, and needle or catheter when the person walks. Okay. Now we have a commercial, commercially made, uh, what's this? Hep lock, uh, which is first connected to the catheter and then the IV fluid is connected there. So if the patient wants to avoid, wants to walk, you just disconnect it and then the patient will not use the IV pole and the IV and to, not to bring the IV with her in the bathroom. Then assist the person with turning and repositioning. Move the IV bag to the side of the bed. If you're turning the patient on the left, you should put also the IV on the left. Always allow enough slack in the tubing. Tell the nurse at once if there is any bleeding on the side of the IV. And tell the nurse at once of any signs of infection. Okay, so these are the complications. Bleeding, blood backing up. Oh, what's the reason of blood backing up? Okay, you're putting the IV lower than your hand or at the level of your hand. Puffiness or swelling, pale or reddened skin, pain on the IV side, hot and cold skin, fever, itching, drop in blood pressure, pulse rate, etc. So these are the complications of IV therapy that we should report immediately to our nurse in charge. So we finished the IV therapy. Next is enteral nutrition. Okay, so what do you mean by enteral nutrition? So enteral nutrition, it involves placing food directly into the stomach or intestine. If your mouth is damaged, if you, you, have, you are having trouble swallowing, the doctor will put or the nurse will put, the, will put a tube okay, in your nose going to your stomach or intestine. Okay? Or he will make an operation to your stomach or colon to open uh, the skin and put a stoma and you eat and will uh, put a catheter on it. Okay, it's called peg tube. So enteral nutrition, it's also called as tube feeding. So we have different types of enteral nutrition, guys. We have the nasogastric tube. So when we're talking about nasogastric tube, naso means nose, gastric is uh, stomach. So the tube is from the nose going to the stomach. So this is the nasogastric tube. Next is nasointestinal tube. It is almost the same, but the tube is longer than the other because the tube will pass through until the intestine. Unlike the NGT or nasogastric tube, it will only pass or, or it will only end in the uh, stomach. So this is how it looks like. So see, nasogastric tube until stomach only. And nasointestinal, it will be until the intestines. So doing this, to enteral feeding, the nasogastric and the nasointestinal, it is, you need to have a precaution. Why? Because there is a high risk of aspiration for this. Why? Because you need to check the placement of the tube every now and then before feeding because it may might be misplaced to the lungs. Okay, it may, might be pulled out and then uh, misplaced to the lungs. That will cause aspiration. And second, you should place the patient into high Fowler's position to prevent aspiration. If we're talking about NGT and nasointestinal, usually it is temporary only. Okay, if your patient is having this uh, treatment, uh, later on, if still the gastrointestinal tract is not regaining its normal function, uh, it will, they will shift it 
to the most permanent one, which is PEG, or percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy. Okay? So, let's go to the permanent enteral feeding. Okay? So, first is gastrostomy tube. Gastro means stomach. Ostomy means incision. So, they made an incision in your stomach. Okay? So, that is gastrostomy tube. So, this is gastrostomy. What do you mean by jejunostomy? Jejunum, it is the part of your small intestine. So, they made an opening in this part of your intestine, which is the jejunum. Okay? So, this is the gastrostomy tube, and this is the jejunostomy tube. How about percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy? Actually, this is type of gastrostomy which uses a visualization device, okay, endoscopy, okay, to put the, to visualize the stomach uh, clearly, okay? It is, uh, is this? it is faster, cheaper, and it is less risky for the place patient and then placement of the regular gastroscopy tube because open abdominal surgery is not needed. So compared to gastrostomy and jejunostomy, it requires open, okay? It needs uh, it will end up in a big wound. But because it will uh, require an open abdominal surgery. But for PEG, okay, it will just put you a small hole and it will have, they will put a video assisted, uh, video assisted camera that will direct you where is the stomach, okay? So that will cause you or will not give you uh, a big wound or big operation. So usually, percutaneous peg gastrostomy and jejunostomy tube, these are less risky compared to nasogastric and nasointestinal tube. Why? Because it's directly sutured in the uh, stomach or intestine. So there will be no tendency that it will be pulled out and go to the lungs. So that's why most of the patient, they will uh, be advised to shift their enteral feeding to this type of feeding because it is less risky, especially for those patients who will be discharged with this type of treatment. Uh, they will be they will uh, use this peg or gastrostomy or jejunostomy tube. So, enteral feeding has different ways. We have intermittent and we have continuous uh, enteral nutrition. So, if we're talking about intermittent, it is bolus, okay? So, we are giving a certain amount of fluid, okay, once. Then it's always every four hours. Uh, so the normal scheduling is 8 a.m., 12 a.m., 12, 12, 8 a.m., 12 p.m., 4 p.m., 8 p.m., uh, 8 p.m., 12 a.m., and 4 a.m. So as we see, six times a day, we are giving the feeding. Okay, Usually it's 240, 250 ml each feeding. So it is called intermittent or bolus feeding. When we're talking about continuous, these feedings are usually given over 24 hours using feeding pump, okay? So this one, they are utilizing an, a machine, okay? They are utilizing a machine to deliver the fluid into the uh, enteral tube. So... This is how it looks like. So on your left, okay, this is the bolus or intermittent feeding. While on your right, this is the continuous feeding.
So, all enteral nutrition, especially nasogastric and nasointestinal, has risk of aspiration. Uh, so, to prevent this, you need to place the patient into Fowler's or high Fowler's position. Then, you need to keep the patient into one to two hours after feeding, okay? To keep the patient in that position for one to two hours to make sure that it the food will not come into your lungs but in your stomach. And make sure the registered nurse or if you're trained to do so, uh, check the tube placement if it's in the appropriate uh, location. Assisting tube feedings. So make sure every tube, catheter, and needle is labeled. Okay, make sure. Trace the tube or the feeding tube back to the insertion site because if the patient is having a lot of tubes, you'll be confused. So to prevent this to happen, we always tra trace the tube from its insertion site. Notify the nurse if there's a sign of any of this problem. Nausea, bloating, pain during the feeding, coughing, gagging, vomiting during the feeding, abdominal distension, diarrhea, drainage from around the tube, and disconnection. If your patient vomited after feeding, you need to place the patient into the sideline position so he can drain the secretions. So I'll teach you how to do enteral feeding, assisting enteral feeding. Next topic is total parenteral nutrition. So what is total parenteral nutrition? Total parenteral nutrition or TPN or hyperalimentation, okay? It is a method of nutrient delivery wherein nourishment is delivered directly into the bloodstream through a large catheter inserted into the large vein near the heart. Okay, so what's the difference between enteral and parenteral, total parenteral nutrition? So, enteral feeding, you are using a tube inserted into the gastrointestinal tract or in the nose or in the mouth. But Total parenteral nutrition, it uses your big veins to give you nutrients. Okay, so that's the difference. So this is the TPN. Okay, as you notice, they will make a surgery. Okay, they'll open the skin and will locate the big vein. Okay, and then they will insert this catheter and they will connect the, they will connect the TPN on this catheter. Okay. During this catheter or TPN, you need to check the sugar of the patient or the CBG of the patient as ordered by the doctor. It, uh, sometimes once a day, three times a day, or twice a day. Why? Uh, because it has a lot of calories, this one, and sugar. So the tendency is the patient might have hyperglycemia. So you need to monitor the sugar. So this ends our discussion in nutrition. Uh, next topic is urinary elimination and bowel elimination. Thank you.